And I want to thank everyone who came out yesterday and helped decorate the, the church. It's just gorgeous up here. In fact, I feel like I'm sort of bringing the whole thing down a little bit here, okay? I wish I were pretty so I could fit up here a little bit better. Um, I hope that during the holidays uh, uh, that you were uh, able to see all the people you wanted to see and that you gained none of the pounds that you didn't want to gain. So I um, hope that was the case for you. But uh, speaking of expanding things, we're going to continue our look at the book of Acts and uh, expand now in our understanding of missions and the expansion of missions. And today we're going to see a big shift in the book of Acts, the big shift that happened. This is really, now we've seen several turning points in the early church, but this is a turning point in the book of Acts. We'll explain that in just a moment. But if you have your Bibles with you or your phones on your phones, uh, turn them on or open them up to Acts chapter 13. We're going to look at the first three verses. Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. Now there were prophets and teachers at Antioch in the church that was there. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were serving the Lord and fasting, the Lord said, Barnabas and Saul, apart from me for the work to which I have called them. Then when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for this Thanksgiving weekend. Father, as we have sung in our first song today, Father, we are not only thankful, but we are grateful. Grateful for, for you what you did for us through your son, Jesus. Father, we thank you for the upcoming holidays, and we thank you that because of Jesus, we understand the giving of thanks. We understand the meaning of Christmas better than most people. Father, we thank you that because of all this, we are able to use this holiday time to engage and celebrate not only with relatives, family, friends, but to engage and to celebrate with you as well. And Father, I thank you for this church and for her leaders. And Father, I thank you for your word that we're looking at today. Father, just guide our hearts and our minds that we may not only understand your word from your Holy Spirit, but that we may be able to apply it in our hearts this week and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's talk about the big shift for a moment. This is where, this is really a big turning point of what Luke did in the book of Acts. See, first, this shift is from Peter to Paul. Up to this point, we've heard a lot about Peter. After this, there's very little about Peter, and the focus goes to what Paul is doing. The second shift in the book of Acts is it shifts from the church in Jerusalem to now to the church in Antioch. In fact, we only go back to the church in Jerusalem one more time in the book of Acts, and it's what's happened on these missionary journeys that were based out of Antioch, that we're going to focus on from now. And then it was ministry, shifted from the ministry to the Jewish community, to ministry to the whole world, everywhere. And that becomes, now you're seeing in this passage, that shift in that mission that Jesus gave us. Remember, the mission was given in Acts 8.1, but you see my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world. In Acts chapter 8, we saw them move from Jerusalem into Judea and Samaria. And up to this point, it's still been pretty much based in that area around Palestine. But at this point, it moved to what was then known as the whole world. And this is why this is important. You may say, well, Pastor, we've already talked about the Ethiopian. We've talked about all these other people that had come in from all over the place to Jerusalem. Yes, but here's the change. This was the first recorded official missionary trip sent out by a church. You see, up to this point, all the mission work had been people coming into Jerusalem, including those at Pentecost and including the Ethiopian eunuch, or people being pushed out of Jerusalem as a part of their uh, of, uh, escaping persecution, or people who were just about their own business and just taking the message wherever they went. Now, that's still a good way for us to share the message of Jesus. In fact, it says that in the, in the Bible that we should go out and as you go, present the gospel, make disciples of all people. And that's what we still want the people of Western Hills to do, that wherever you go, whether it be 
to uh, a, a neighbor's house or to Safeway or to uh, another state or on vacation or wherever it might be, that a good way to do it. Because our, our assignment is to make disciples wherever we go. We're going to get more about that in a future sermon. For today, we're going to look at these three passages, and we're going to look at several things in it. The first, I want you to see who the people who are involved were. The people involved. Luke mentions five key leaders in the church, and he calls them pastors and teachers. Now, we don't have time to go into a lot of that today. There's a lot of, I've read all the commentaries on it. I, there are a lot of people out there smarter than me, and I've learned if I can learn from them, it'll look, it'll look like I'm smarter than them, but I'm, I'm not. But I've looked and tried to figure out what they mean, and some people think these are two separate offices or the same thing or whatever. All we know right now is that Luke was saying there were people in the church that were serving as pastors, caring for people, and were, were teaching. And here are the five main ones. They may have been the only five, or it may have been just the ones that were important to Luke at this time. So he says these pastors and teachers, or just not pastors, um, prophets and teachers. I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Prophets and teachers. How did I miss that, okay? Um, a typo in my, in my thing here, okay? Um, now, let me kind of tell you a little bit about that. We're just going to digest for just a moment. The idea of prophet is something that really has been sort of messed up in our current culture. When we think of prophet today, we think of somebody who tells the future. We think of prophecy, being a prophecy of, of telling what's going to happen in the future, predicting when Jesus is going to come, uh, predicting, your, or you watch movies, and there's all about the ancient prophet that predicted this person was going to do this or whatever. That's not what Old Testament prophets were about. You see, Old Testament prophets were more about, and this is not for me, I stole this, but it, it's not about foretelling the future, but telling forth or foretelling what God said. And that was the main job of the prophet. The prophet took God's message and gave it to the people. Now, there were times that it did look like they were telling the future because sometimes the prophecy would, the, the message from God would be this. If you don't do what I say right now, God said, then this is going to happen. And when the people didn't do what God said, that happened. And so they, oh, we predicted the future. No, the message was not about what's happening in the future. The message is about what you're supposed to be doing right now. God's message toward you. Now, there were also times that, God did reveal the future to his prophets to validate his word or to, to simply prove the accuracy of his message. And so as a result, things got sort of tied into telling the future, but that's not it. Remember, the prophet takes God's message and gives it to the people. Now, in modern day, the, generally the office of prophet is considered in most churches to be the, the pulpit minister, the pastor. Now, it makes me a little uncomfortable. Because that's not saying that every pastor has the gift of prophecy. Let me say that really quick. All right? But anytime we're taking God's message and giving it to the people, we are serving in that prophetic role. So when a Sunday school teacher or a small group leader, leading that, when they are out of that Bible study, able to give to people a message that God wants them to hear today, then they are also serving the role of prophet at that point. Okay? Again, it doesn't mean that's their spiritual gift but it means that's what they're doing at that point. Now, you can't have a Bible study or even a sermon that doesn't have God's message in it. So there, there are many times, and I've probably done it myself somewhere, where I've been a preacher, but I haven't been a prophet. There wasn't a God's message in it because I just missed something or I was distracted or whatever. But generally speaking, if you're giving God's message to people, that's the role of the prophet. The opposite of this is the role of the priest. Now, this is a sidebar. This is sort of free here. The priest's job was exactly the opposite. The priest in the Old Testament took the people's message before God. So the prophet comes before the people on behalf of God. The priest comes before God on behalf of the people. Now, today, we don't have priests. In evangelical churches like ours, you don't have anybody who's known as a priest because of two things. First, because Jesus himself has become our high, our high priest. It says that in Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. The, the author of Hebrews says, the main point in what I've been saying is this. We have such a high priest, talking about Jesus, who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heaven, a minister in the sanctuary, and in the true tabernacle, which the Lord set up, not man. And so Jesus has become our high priest. We don't need anybody else to take us before God because Jesus says that not only Jesus, 
but the Holy Spirit also intercedes for us before God. Romans chapter 8, verse 26, says that the Spirit himself intercedes for us, comes in between to uh, intercede for us with groanings too deep for words. Some people have interpreted that as sometimes when you're praying and you don't really know exactly what to say, it's almost like the Holy Spirit says, okay, God, what Daryl's trying to say to you right now is this, because I know his heart and what he's trying to say, and that's not exactly like that, but that's the image I like to use to help understand how that happens. And so this idea of not having a priest now is also one of the reasons why that we have adopted, a, uh, as, as all of our sister churches have, a doctrine of the priesthood of the believer, that people are able to go before God on their own because of what Jesus has done. By the way, this is one of the reasons why in our church that we take many of our decisions that we make as a church and we take it to the membership because we believe that while God speaks primarily through our leaders, God also speaks to all the people. And so there is that, that doctrine of priesthood of believers. You don't need anybody else to pray for you. We do pray for each other as a privilege, that kind of thing, but you can go right to God yourself and talk to him at any time because of what Jesus has done for us. All right, now, so to, to move on, um, let's look at these five people that we have here today, all right? First, there was Barnabas. Barnabas was listed first, and he was probably the key leader in the book of Antioch. He had a lot of things going for him. First, he was an emissary from the church of Jerusalem. They sent him up there to meet with the people in Antioch and to talk with them. We saw that in Acts 11. He was Jewish. He was from the tribe of Levi, which means his ancestors had a strong connection to the earthly temple ministry in the Old Testament and in Jewish history. But he lived in Cyprus, where he was from originally. That meant he was a Hellenist. And so, uh, by the way, we also learned in Acts chapter 11 that it was men from Cyprus who first went up to Antioch to share the message. So, um, so it could have been, you know, uh, uh, that he was involved, you know, knew some of the people who were there at that point. So that's, that's Barnabas. Uh, second, there's Simeon. Now, we don't know who Simeon really is. He's not readily identifiable in any other passage. Some people think he might have been the Simeon from Cyrene who was made to carry the cross of Jesus. Uh, actually, there's there's nothing in the Bible to connect them. So at this point, there's no reason to assume that he is, and there's no reason to rule it out either. So if you like thinking that he was the guy that carried the cross, that's great. And that's just, you know, a, a good guess. I guess we can ask him when we all get to heaven. But, um, but all we know for this is that he was, his nickname was Niger. Now, this tells us two things about the guy. First, we know that he also was a Hellenist, because Niger is a Roman nickname. So he, had, he traveled in Roman circles, so he was probably a Hellenist himself. And because Niger is Greek for black, it means he was probably dark-skinned. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that he was from Africa. He may have had an uh, ancestry in Africa. He may not have. We don't know. But there's a good guess that he was probably um, a Jewish Hellenist Christian from North Africa because of that. That's our best guess. His name, Simeon, is a Jewish name, too, so he had to be probably a Hellenist Jew at that point. Then we have Lucius, another one we don't know much about. Some people think that Lucius might have been Luke, the author. Am I messed up? Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm on. Let's use the mic here. Okay, this one's not working. All right, that just means I can't go, I can't go wandering around. Yes, Lord, and I'm listening. So, all right. Sorry about that. So, okay. Where were you, Lucius? Uh, some people think that Lucius might have been Luke, the author of the Book of Acts. Uh, but in, actually, in Greek, Lucius and Luke are two different names. So, probably not that person. But we do know that he was a North African, perhaps like Simeon, because he was from Cyrene, which is a modern-day Libya. And you may remember, as we talked in Acts 11, that the people who shared the gospel in, in, in Antioch were Jews from Cyprus and from Cyrene. So Lucius may have been one of the original evangelists in Antioch, but he was a leader there, again, a Hellenistic Jew from North Africa. 
Athenian is only mentioned here in the Bible. This is all we know about him. And the only thing we know is that he was raised with King Herod, Herod the Tetrarch. Now, this is the King Herod who beheaded John the Baptist. This is the King Herod before whom Jesus had to appear during his trial and who was a part of condemning Jesus to death. Now, this guy, Menean, the word there is almost like a... a is almost used for like a foster brother. And what would happen in royal families is if there was a young child and there weren't other children for them to be to play with and raise with, they would adopt other kids to be litter mates, I guess, you know, for any better word for that for the people growing up. So he was a childhood friend or a foster brother of King Herod. Now, this tells us a couple of other things about him. Because he was in this area, he was an aristocrat. He traveled in aristocratic, uh, aristocratic circles. And because of that, he was probably connected with the Sadducees. So his beliefs would have been because all the arist uh, aristocratic people of that day generally tended toward the Sadducee sect of Judaism. So it's a, it's a pretty good guess that he was a Sadducee. Now that's important to note because of the last person about whom we need to say the least and that is Saul, that we know eventually became known as Paul. And Paul was a rabbi, often fought with the Sadducees. He was a rabbi who was trained by Gamaliel in the realm of the Pharisees. So he had a Sadducee and a Pharisee there. And um, he was also a consummate Pharisee. You can look at Act in Philippians chapter 3. Paul talks about how he was like a Pharisee of the Pharisees, a Jew of the Jews. He was like... <coughs> I was like the person. If you wanted to, if you wanted to see what a good Jew was like, that's you look at me. That's what I, the kind of life I lived. So as we look at this group of people that we have here, we have three people with strong Jewish backgrounds, four who were probably Hellenists, two who were from North Africa, two who were from Asia Minor, one from Judea, and at least one who was a Sadducee and one who was a Pharisee. This makes me think as I look at this diversity. This is one of the things I love about Western Hills Church. We have such a diversity of backgrounds here. Those of you who are online can't see who we have in the auditorium, but we have, we have a lot of different backgrounds here in our church. And out of this, we have chosen to come together as a church to accomplish the mission that God has for us. And that's exactly what the Church of Antioch did. In Antioch, they didn't create a Hellenist church. They didn't create a Sadducee church. They didn't create a North African church. They created one church. Now, let me kind of say something about this, though. They were able to do this because of the language. They all spoke Greek. So that was people who lived in Antioch. Pretty much that was the trade language. Unlike most Americans today, back then people spoke two and three languages or more, whereas most of us struggle with English, you know, uh, let alone another language, or at least I do. So as we, as we look at this, they were able to do that. So don't hear me saying that we shouldn't have separate congregations for things. When I was um, at a church in, in, in the Central Valley, we had a Spanish language congregation, one church, but we had a service service that was in, in Spanish. When I was at the Chinese church, we had a service that was in English, a service that was in Cantonese, a service that was in Mandarin. And so that's not separating it out and saying, but, but again, we know that sometimes it is okay to have a separate church, but Western Hills isn't one of those churches. We have a variety of backgrounds here, and I really like that about our church because it identifies us with the Antioch church more than the Jerusalem church. Not that the Jerusalem church was bad, but the Antioch church is where the mission expanded. Now, what better group could there have been in Antioch to initiate the first official missionary enterprise? The gospel was for the whole world, and it was empowered by a diverse group of leaders. They, because of this, I believe they they had a diverse understanding of the known world and a greater view of the mission that Jesus gave his people. Their focus wasn't just their homeland. Their focus wasn't just their people. Their focus wasn't just their language. Their focus was the world, just like Jesus said. And as Western Hills continues to move forward with our mission, with our part of God's mission, it will happen when we involve as many people as possible from different backgrounds. Yes, like in Antioch, it has to start with the leaders, but with a variety of leaders. And your new pastor will be a part of that. 
I've never forgotten that my main job here is to help you get ready and to, to locate a new pastor here. I'm but a temporary person. So your new pastor will be a key, but it will take others, pastors, teachers. Right now we have elders and deacons and other gifted people, people who may not even have an official position with the church. But starting with the leaders, it has to come down to a diverse group of people to lead us to expand the mission where God wants us to go. So that's why choosing your next pastor when that time comes will be so vitally important for you. And with that in mind, let's look at our second point, not the people, but the process they went through. I want you to notice two things that the church did before God spoke to them. The first thing they did is they served and they fasted those two things. Now the word serving here is the word where we get the word liturgy. The liturgy, you think, when I think of liturgy, like you go to a Catholic church, it's their order of service, that kind of thing. Literally, the liturgy just means the way of doing things, of, of ordering things. And so they were going about their everyday business, serving or ministering, some very similar word here, translated in different uh, translations. So here's what they were doing. They were worshiping, they were doing ministry, they were taking care of people, they were having classes, they were telling other people about Jesus, all the things a church should be doing. The same things that we need to be doing today, worshiping, ministering, taking care of people, having classes, growing in our discipleship, sharing the message of Jesus with others. Now, we'll do it differently than they did. You know, this is not 60 AD or about 45, 48 AD, somewhere around here at this point. You know, it's, 20, it's uh, 2021, so we'll do it differently than they did it, but we still need to be doing it. And that's part of uh, having good leaders who will help us figure out what it looks like for us in 2021 on the San Francisco Peninsula to know what that kind of mini uh, ministry should be. The second thing they did is they fasted. We're not quite there yet, so there's, we're still on that served and fasted there, okay? Perhaps, uh, we don't know exactly why they fasted. Now, there could be a couple of reasons. Could be a holdover from just their Jewish roots. Certain sects of, of Jewish life fasted twice a week. You can actually even see that in the Bible in Luke 18, 12. There's a story of the Pharisee and the tax collector, and the Pharisee is there at the temple praying, and he's telling God, I fast twice a week, which was not uncommon. I can't remember the exact days, but there were certain days that they fasted for part of the day as a part of their regular liturgy, as you might say. Uh, but they also could have fasted for this reason. Perhaps in Antioch, seeing the diversity of people there, like we have here in the Bay Area, they were already beginning to get a burden, a sense of, of desire to take the gospel to new areas. Now, we don't know for sure if that's the reason, but that would be a good reason for fasting. Then there are two things they did after the Holy Spirit spoke to them. It says, and it's on your screen there, it says they fasted and they prayed. Now, I want you to know that they continued to fast even after they got the message from God. And this time it definitely was with a specific purpose for the mission they were about to fulfill. I want you to know, I'm going to talk a little bit about fasting here, and, and uh, I'm nervous about doing it because I've not been great in my, it's, it's not been a great spiritual discipline for me. Um, and it's not something the churches talk about a lot today. I don't know why that is. Perhaps it was so much more common in, in, in Bible days, uh, or back in days when food was scarce, it wasn't uncommon for people to wind up missing a meal anyway, so they were used to that. Today, we have a fast food restaurant on every corner. There's supermarkets everywhere. We see food commercials everywhere. In fact, there's probably been very few times that you, in your life when you've been unable to get to food. You know, for me, the times that I've, um, you know, been on a trip and I've been, you know, when I traveled for the convention, I'd be traveling through Northern California, through the high desert somewhere, and I might have to go 50 or 80 miles without a cup of coffee. And I'm like, just almost panic, panicky. Like, I've, I've ever, never been this far from a Starbucks in my life. I don't know what I'm going to do, you know, but we're not, so we're not used to that. We don't think about fasting as much. 
Now, I realize, I don't want to be callous here, okay? I realize that even here in the Bay Area, we have people who suffer from food insecurity. And I do not want to be callous to that at all. And, um, I, and, we're, and we have people who are not far from here who go to bed hungry at night. And I don't ever want our church to be, to be callous for that. In fact, I'm very thankful that there are people in our church that are involved with feeding homeless people. And there are people who are very generous. And I want our church to be a church of generosity. Uh, so even though we ask you to tithe to our church for the ministries that we do, that God also said beyond that, this is another sermon for another time, but just to say that, that in the Old Testament, they not only tithe to the temple, but they're also commanded to be generous with those in need. And so I want to encourage you as a church to do that. Even as we talk about fasting and about how hard it might be for us to do it nowadays. So, um, so I just want to say, remember that. But nonetheless, for most of us, if not all of us, food is not an issue. We're used to three meals a day and we're seldom unable to, to obtain food. But in spite of all that, I want you to start thinking about fasting in preparation for calling your new pastor. Now, I know it's, it's kind of cruel to mention that right after Thanksgiving. Okay, that's, and I'm sorry for the timing on that. And I'm not going to call for us to have a fast right now. First, I haven't talked this over with the other elders yet, so I don't trust myself to know that this is the right thing to do at this time. So I want to talk it over with, with others because, I mean, there's, there's definitely counselors, and I want to talk to people and, and see if it's something that we can do. Um, the second, I don't want to do it during the holidays because the holiday time is a time for celebration and gathering with friends and family. And so it, I don't want to make that uh, confusing for us. But perhaps, I'm saying perhaps after the holidays, we may call for some kind of a fast. If we do, we won't be legalistic about it. I want to expand your, your idea about fasting. This is why I'm sort of informing you at, at hand. Even if we decide not to do it as a church, you may consider doing it individually here. So let me expand your concept. I usually think of fasting, a typical fast is a 24-hour period. To me, that's, that's what I normally think of. Usually, when I would fast, I would start after lunch on one day and pick it back up with dinner the next day. Now, there's nothing spiritual, there's nothing biblical about that. It's just fell, fell along more with what the Jewish concept of the day starting in the evening and the Sabbath starting in the evening. And so, I just typically tended to follow that myself. Um, and I think the longest I've ever gone with a fast is probably probably a little over three days. There's, there's probably been four or five times in my life I've done a three-day fast. Friends of mine who have done two-week fast, or even one friend who did a 40-day fast, uh, tell, it's, it's a lot different. So I haven't experienced all that that goes through fasting at this point. So I, I come before you not as an expert on fasting. I want you to know that, all right? So, uh, so I'm just trying to expand our ideas about it. But I want you to know the purpose of a fast is not to go X amount of days without food. The purpose of a fast is to give up something temporarily so that you can focus on God, either through prayer or a time of repentance or a time of study or some kind of spiritual discipline that you need to do. So I want to say that again. The purpose of a fast is to give up something temporarily so that you can focus on prayer, repentance, study, or some other kind of spiritual discipline, making a decision perhaps. Um, so in light of that, giving up one meal once a week could be a fast. For some of us that, um, that, that really say, I just can't see myself fasting for three days or for a week or something like that. If you give up one meal that day, but take that time that you would have eaten that meal to remind yourself to be in prayer or to study God's word or to be involved in some kind of spiritual discipline, then even for that hour that you have given up that meal, you are fulfilling part of the role of a fast at that point. One of the things I always did with the fast is every time I felt hungry, I remember, I remember why I'm doing that, and I would turn my focus to God at that point. So every time I felt a hunger pain, which is, you know, wasn't much of one, you know, after a one or two or three day fast, but, but every time I felt that, I would, I would try to take that time and focus on God again so that I spent more time focusing on Him. For those of us, us who can't skip a meal, maybe for medical reasons or other reasons, a fast can also be giving up something else that you like. 
Now, for example, maybe you give up TV one evening a week and you take that time to focus on prayer or repentance or uh, study or some other spiritual discipline. Or maybe you give up social media. Oh my gosh, the benefits of that more than anything else would be, might, might be that. Um, giving up your phone. Think for a moment. Okay, think for me just a moment. Does it bring a smile to your face? Just think about the possibility of just changing your, vo your, your voicemail on your phone to be, I am unavailable for the next day. Leave a message and I'll deal with it later. But other than that, you're not going to be able to reach me. And just turn your phone off and not have it for a little bit. And then most of us, that's a mixture of, oh my gosh, I don't know if I can do that. And oh, that would be so nice. So maybe consider that as a possible way of doing it. Or maybe for some people giving up sleep. That that may you might have to spend the night in prayer or in study instead, and give up sleep as a part of that fast or some other hobby or activity that you may enjoy. And that the key there is may enjoy. So if any of you are hearing, yes, I can give up going to the gym for a week as a part of my fast. No, that doesn't work. Okay, unless the gym is something you really enjoy and you're going to take your gym time and study instead. All right. So do remember, you can't do that. Or I'm going to give up doing chores around the house, that kind of thing. Anyway, I'm just saying this so that you can start thinking about it and perhaps we'll revisit that after the holidays. But our point for today is the church fasted before God spoke to them. The church fasted when God spoke to them and they were setting apart their leaders. And so as we're looking towards having a new pastor, fasting might be a great way. Now, let me rephrase that. Fasting is a great way to help us focus on that decision, help hear God's word better, his direction direction for us and to be able to better know who the right person is, the right direction to go with our pastoral leadership. And then after we've looked at the people in the process, I want to look at the purpose. This is big for me. I think this is really something we have to look at. It says in verse three, they fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them. Now, just a quick note again, a quick sidebar. We don't know if this laying on the hands was the church, the whole church, or just the leaders. The, the Greek is not really clear there, just as they. And there's some places that makes it look like the whole church, just the leaders. But in either case, we know that this wasn't what we think of as ordination. When we uh, sometimes ordain a pastor, or ordain a deacon, or, or license somebody for the ministry, or commission somebody, we do sometimes a laying on of hands. And we saw that in the, in the in the choosing of the seven in Acts chapter six, that that was a sense of um, bestowing, there was a little sense of bestowing spiritual power or authority on them. And that's not necessarily what was going here. It looks like that the laying on of hands was really a deeper way of praying for them and a way of symbolizing that they were going out with the authority of the church. And the reason we say it wasn't the actual conferring of authority, because Barnabas was one of the ones going out and Barnabas was probably already the highest spiritual authority at the church in Antioch. And Saul was becoming, was the up and coming, you know, next best thing coming up. He was the new sliced bread of the Antioch church. And so he was, uh, so, so they didn't need spiritual, con a spiritual transfer of authority, but it was a symbolic kind of thing of saying, you are going out in our name and in the name of Jesus also. So a deeper method of affirming them and praying for these missionaries. And a great way to look at it might be commissioning. Commissioning is a one uh, way to, to look at that. I've had the uh, t a couple of times in my life been able to go to a missionary commissioning, and I tell you, it's just an amazing thing. It is a moving sight to see people who are leaving friends, family, leaving their culture, and committing their lives to working with people in a different land. And for um, our, us and our sister churches through our denomination to commission those missionaries to go out has been a great, just a moving, moving site. And maybe you've seen that in a church where we've just sent on a mission team and been able to do that. Very much same kind of thing. But now I want you to know that this one verse right here has set the standard for, for churches on how they do mission work for centuries. 
Now, I would never want to criticize someone who strikes that on their own as a missionary. Jesus said, those that aren't against us are for us, and I would never criticize somebody there. But I think the wisest and most biblical way for churches, I mean, for, to send out missionaries, is for them to go out from churches, from a church or from a group of churches. Now, I want to say why we do, how we do it in our denomination, because we're a denomination of almost 50,000 churches nationwide. It would be easy for churches to to get to be stumbling over each other and stepping over each other. That if we have, you know, there could be a thousand churches that have um, a desire to send missionaries to Paris, France, or something like that. But then no churches that decide that fill the call to send a to send somebody to. Um, some, you know, little place nobody's ever heard of before. I mean, you know, if, if, if God were to you know, appear right now and say, who wants to be a missionary to Tahiti? I would be like, that's okay. You don't need to listen. I'm going God. You know, that would be, that'd be like my, you know, dream missionary sort of place there at that point. But um, so what we do is that if somebody in our church or one of our sister churches believes God's calling them into ministry, then our churches would send them to our international mission board. That would be either be by going to seminary and then working there and get training, but the International Mission Board would then vet them and make sure they're meeting standards and, and make sure they're taken care of. And then the International Mission Board, made up of people that, that churches like ours get to elect every year at our, at our denomination's annual meeting. And in fact, this next year in 2022, that will be in Anaheim, and our church could send up to 10 people down there as messengers from our church to be a part of that and voting on on who's on that international mission board and then that international mission board commissions them and sends them out with a network and we provide some of our church budget to be a part of supporting those missionaries so again we don't see it so much in our individual church because we have a more systematic way of doing it not necessarily that one is more biblical than the other, but I think ours makes more sense for getting the gospel to places that it needs to be. So when our missionaries go out, they go out not from one church, but from four, over 40,000, almost 50,000 different churches. Now, Christmas time is a time when we really focus on international missions. In fact, international missions is a part of our local uh, giving thing that we have. So I have for us today, I want to just play a short video for you of uh, where some of our missions money goes when we look at international missions. So take a moment with this video. It's about a minute and a half. When we look at the unreached people groups in our part of the world and in most of the world, their preference to learn is through stories, it's through morality. You come in with God's stories and you're seeing His Spirit changing lives. I've seen it. I've told stories and they listen and they love it and they begin to ask us questions. And if God opens the door to where we can continue to tell them more and more stories. And out of that ministry, we began to see we needed more people to do this ministry. And where are we going to get them? We wanted the people that we were training to train other people. And so we began teaching in the pastor's schools and the, the students pastors were excited about it. They said it's something that we use. It's applicable. It works. They already speak the language. They wear the same clothes. They eat the same food. All we have to do is help them to understand methods and ways that they can reach their people. The people that we're training now are the product of missionaries who came before me. They accepted Christ under these missionaries. We're training them in schools that IMB Money helped to fund, to build. It's an amazing thing. You can pray, keep the mission going. You can give, keeps the mission going. And you can go. Look at me. I used to sell tire supplies. <laughs> Here I am teaching people how to tell stories. <laughs> Thanks for praying and giving and come on over. And if you didn't catch that, there was a little not so subtle message there, though, that for those of you, I know we have a, a number of people that are in our church that are retired or retirement age, getting close to that. Yes, there's opportunities for you to go overseas and be a part of our mission work over there. So I want you during this time also to be considering and asking God, are you sending me somewhere or are there people out of our church that we need to be sending somewhere? We also do local missions like a good example is part of our local stuff is we're going to uh, help support crossings church. That is a church that we sent out to be a preaching port in Belmont, and we help support them regularly by letting them use a the facility that we have down there. 
And so I want you to know we're involved in missions now, and that's something I want our church to still be a part of. But we said we're talking about the purpose here. So let's go back to that. Why did they send them out? Was it just because the Holy Spirit said so? Well, that's a good enough reason. But I also see in this the heart of a people to expand the mission of the gospel. Some of our discussions about our future to church, I've had several people mention to me the fact that it's really important that we reach younger generations. And I agree with that. My heart beats for younger generations. That I, I, I totally agree with that. But it's equally important for us to talk about why, about what's our purpose in reaching younger generations. Because you know what? It's, it's no more spiritual to reach younger generations than it is to reach older generations. The Great Commission didn't say, go therefore and make disciples of all young people instead of all the nations. And in fact, it's been documented that it's more difficult to reach an older person with the gospel than as a younger person. Something like 80% of the people who ever accept Jesus as a personal Lord and Savior do so before age 20. So churches that sometimes target older people to say that's who we're going to go for are actually taking on a more difficult assignment. Let's go back. Some, some churches want to reach young people because they miss having a children's ministry or miss having a youth ministry. In church, that's not mission. That's nostalgia. If that's the reason for doing it, then that's not a mission. That's just wanting to go back to something I miss rather than mission. Some churches want to reach young people because they realize they're a church of older people. And, if they, and they realize if they don't reach younger people, eventually church will die. Well, that's not mission. That's survival. That's survival. And our purpose as a church is not to go back to nostalgia. Our purpose as a church is not even to survive. A church that wants to reach younger people because they have a God-given heart and a vision for carrying the gospel to the next generation kind of church has a very different set of goals. They aren't concerned about survival or nostalgia. They don't care if the church looks the same as it did decades ago. They don't care if the property or the name stays the same. They don't even care about holding on to leadership or control. They are eager to let the new generations take on leadership and do it differently. I know it's tough, but when you've got a heart, it makes it easier. It makes it easier for things. You see, the church at Antioch took 40% of their named leadership and sent them away. 40%. There were five leaders mentioned, and two of them, they said, we're going to send you away on a mission trip that took somewhere, people think, between 18 months and as much as three years. We don't know for sure. It doesn't tell us exactly, but that's the best guess of people who've studied this and looked at other documents and things, extra biblical stuff. And so they've sent them away. And this church was on the cusp of being the next great thing in the Christian ministry. They were becoming the flagship church for Christianity. But they didn't want to hold on to that. They didn't want to say, we're going to keep Barnabas. We're going to keep Saul. They said, we want to see new churches spring up. We want to see there be new people out there. They weren't concerned about competition. They weren't concerned about survival. They were concerned about the mission. And as we look to our future as a church, we always have to consider our purpose as a church when we make decisions. This includes choosing our new pastoral leadership, but it also is the case with any leaders. As we continue to focus our vision for the future, remember it's not about what's comfortable to us. It's not about what we had in the past. It's not about our survival. It's about the mission that God has given Western Hills in 2021 and beyond. And just as the book of Acts went through a big shift, I believe God has a big shift ahead for Western Hills. I don't have any idea what it is. But as I look at the leaders that we have, as I look at the gifting that's here, if I look at the heart and passion of people here, and look at some of the things this church has gone through, and that we are all still here, committed to Jesus, and committed to this church, 
I believe God would not have kept this church here if he didn't have a big plan. I am certain of this. The Western Hills of the future will not look like the Western Hills of the past. I don't think that's good. Now, that could be good news or bad news, depending on how you, look, how you, how you slice that. But it will be different because God, just like with the Church of Antioch, there's a big shift ahead of us. And we need to be serving and praying and fasting and getting ready for what God wants to do through us. Let's pray. Father, it is scary to think about a big shift that we might have. Father, it's scary even to talk about it. Father, as we look to this big shift, Father, we don't want to run ahead of you. Father, if this big shift means we're a bigger church, if this big shift means we're a different church, if this big shift means that we're eventually not a church, but that some other new iteration of ministry has come here, then Father, we, we want to be a part of it, whatever it is you want. Father, if that shift in ministry builds something here on this property, great. If it builds it in another place, as with the Church of Antioch, then Father, we are all in for it. We trust you and we follow you. And so, Father, help us lay aside our fears of the future. Um, Father, help us lay aside our desires of the future even so that we can focus on your plans for our future. Father, we commit to offering our church for anything you have for us. If our desires can be a part of it, if our location can be a part of it, if our current structures can be a part of it, great, Father, and we would be joyous to be a part of that. But whatever it takes from us, just as it took from the church of Antioch, we offer it to you, Father you may use us to see your great commission done in 2021 and beyond. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As always, I want to talk about what you can do to be a part of this. And here's some things I think about in light of what we saw in Acts chapter 13. First, pray for your leaders, both your current leaders and your past leaders. I mean, your future leaders. I'm sorry. Not, well, you can pray for your past leaders too, but pray for your current leaders and your future leaders. Praying for that new pastor who might come, a new staff that might be here. Second, pray for our involvement in missions, both local missions and international. Be praying for, this is actually our, our week of prayer starting today for, for international missions. And if you go to imb.org, um, you saw it up there earlier on the screen, imb.org, you can find a whole lot of things to be praying for, missionaries to be praying for during this time of focused prayer for international missions. And then third, consider how you might fast. And I have it in quotation marks up there because not just a food fast, but whatever God might lead you to do to help you focus on Him better during this time and in 2022. And then finally, focus on our purpose as a church. Asking God to reveal to us what it is we can do, how we can be a better church. We're a good church, but how we can be a better church in the future. And as Jen's coming now to lead us, I just want to encourage you all, as you sing this song, let your hearts be open to God to speak to you about how you can move forward in our next big shift. Jen.